to kick things off, uh, we've got a very experienced panel today. Maybe we could start with uh, a quick round of introductions. Marco? Yes, uh, uh, probably <laughs> a part of these uh, people uh, knows uh, because uh, they just uh, attended to presentation, my presentation. But I'm uh, Marco Boero. I'm uh, working uh, in CSI for uh, more than 20 years. I the head of data and uh, integration uh, platform. Uh, we deal uh, with data uh, for a, a long time, and my company delivery digital services for the public administration from uh, my region, Piedmo region, but also for uh, all the public administration uh, of uh, Italy. Colin? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Colin Bavirukamu, it's a long name. Um, I've, uh, I work as a director for e-government services or digital government in the Republic of Uganda. So I double as a government CIO, but I also uh, work for the National IT Authority, which is both a regulator, but also uh, you know, implements first line government services. I've been in the industry for about 24 years, and uh, I'm very enthusiastic about digital transformation and glad to be here. Thank you, Colin. Masis? Um, so, yeah, um, uh, I am the least experienced here. <laughs> uh, uh, but, yeah, I'm uh, Marcis uh, Gergensand. Um, I work at the State Regional Development Agency of Latvia. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> worked in this field <laughs> for only three years, but uh, also, yeah, really excited. Uh, for uh, for digital transformation and uh, the open data concepts uh, of our job. Thank you, Manish. Yeah, hi. Um, can you hear me well? Um, my name is Manish Atwek. I got similar to you, 24 years of IT experience. Um, been in the United States for almost 20 years. I worked in the public sector for a pretty long time. Uh, worked on uh, using WS2 products um, since 2014. Um, you know, we have got exciting stories uh, and success stories, I should say, with uh, WSO2 itself. Uh, whether it's identity access management, IM solution, or whether it's making sure we are interacting with our partners using standard integration platform. WSO2 has been kind of a very good product to be with. We got uh, big wins. We went live in 28 days, you won't believe that. Um, uh, right, it couldn't even spell WSO2, so that's kind of the uh, experience we had. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, we are having some interesting time right now with our public sector in the US. I have worked in uh, uh, different departments in the public sector. Now I'm an ind independent consultant as well. I've got my own company, so very excited to uh, meet the panelists. Thanks, Manish. Uh, so to kick things off, Marco, uh, you took us through your uh, CSI's uh, strategy to uh, implement APIs for the public sector. Can you talk us through what Italy's digitization journey has been so far and what the next two or three years would look like? Yes, yes, of course. Um, we, we are working on this uh, for uh, a long time, not only for, uh, for application, of course. Uh, and um, we started uh, from data. Uh, we, um, I can give you an example, uh, uh, 10 years ago, we put in place a platform, it's a smart data platform, uh, the name is Yuka, uh, that is a big data platform, because uh, our approach is to collect the data from all the public administration, uh, it's like an ingestion process, and uh, analyze all this data to give back to the, um, the public administration uh, people uh, a way to governance the information, the asset, uh, and governance, the territory that uh, they've managed. Uh, this is the first approach that uh, we, we put in place, uh, uh, but not only, because uh, this is uh, for control the, the process of the public administration. But uh, we have to involve also the citizen and the businesses because uh, the focus uh, at the end is the final user, not only uh, the, the public administration. Uh, and we are working to uh, melt 
decisional information with operational information uh, to give back uh, to, the, uh, to the citizen new services. Uh, so this is our approach. And uh, of course, API help us to do this, uh, but also, as I said before, also AI technology will help to give a new experience uh, for, the, for the final users. So, so with that digitization approach, has every department run their own roadmaps, or do they feed into a bigger strategy? In, in, in the context of uh, my region, CSI do this uh, for, for all of them, because uh, we have a, a big group that uh, have a big skill uh, on this, so we are doing this in a centralized way. And uh, sometimes, when, when, when we can, uh, also, we merge uh, uh, data from different departments mm. because sometimes it's a, it's a good way to try to understand uh, different uh, uh, behavior. Mm. Yeah. So, so, Manish, what about you? In your experience, have you uh, sort of seen one strategy implemented by multiple organizations or, or is it uh, each organization running their own roadmaps? Yes, yeah, so I was giving an example yesterday. If you go Costco shopping, people have grocery list, right? And if you look at public sector and cross-section of that, especially in the United States, the Health and Human Services you know, works under the you know, federal grants project. So we get direction as to do the same thing. So not only departments within a state, but if you are an HHS, say, state of Arizona, uh, state of Nebraska, they have kind of the same shopping list. So you kind of want a citizen portal. You really want them to find uh, a way to make them eligible for the government aid program. Um, so I would say that the roadmaps are kind of a given in terms of where you want to be, but how you get to that point could be your choice. Um, and, and I think most of the that and that shopping list I was talking about is more towards um, bent on compliance, making sure you follow those standards or statutes, uh, if you will. Uh, and U.S. government is way ahead in terms of um, you know putting that posture together, whether it's compliance, whether it's making sure you meet the 90-10 funding criteria, where you uh, get to understand what that request from the federal agency is, whether it's IRS, whether it's SSA, whether it's a CMS. Um, so I would say the overarching umbrella is the same. So it's the same. It's like you have to go to Costco to the shopping. You also have the same list. But I think the choice of whether I use an uh, open source product like yourself, like WSO2, for example, or we go with uh, some paid services is individual, I mean, individual department choice and also an individual agency choice. Uh, in my in my perspective, so we got a similar roadmap pretty much if you look at it, uh, but then what goes in those individual items in terms of the pieces of software when it comes to the technical aspect is driven specifically either by the amount of funding they have and the grants they have received, and whether they have skill set within the division to support that kind of technology, if you will. But uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same list. Um, um, and then the roadmaps define the timelines and uh, time to you know get to that uh, you know ramping up and kind of getting to the you know, go live portion of it is again individual agency. So we do we do see some of them when we go to those you know the interstate meet I was talking about with with the different state agencies and federal agencies they have similar uh, needs but the timelines the pieces of things which they are doing, individual piece of software and choice, is completely there. It's like somebody got a strawberry, somebody got a banana flavor, but then they all like fruits. So it's, it's kind of that for as far as the roadmap goes. Yeah, okay. And I think, uh, Colin, going back to what you guys have done in Uganda over the last two and a half years, uh, what are the issues you came across integrating all those bespoke legacy applications into UG Hub? Mm. Um, yeah, thank you. It's, it was, it's been quite a journey, and that journey still carries on. It's uh, really, we're still grappling with, with uh, issues that maybe many countries will not probably even envisage. Like I said, we still have connectivity issues, so we have many entities that are not connected. So they're actually running manual, paper-based systems and not connected in the rural areas. Uh, but it, talking about, so there's connectivity, there's just device access, for our population, that's still a challenge. But going back to just G2G connectivity, and I imagine that's the context, you know, what are the issues about uh, 
getting these organizations to work together. So we found that many of these organizations, number one, were still struggling with letting go of their data because their data was their power. Their data was their mandate. It was, it was what gave them uh, the authority. So when you come and say, you've got to open up your data now to other government institutions, citizens, the first thing people do is hold back. So there was a lot of hold back from government institutions. They felt that opening up was first of all letting go of their locus of control. But the second issue is that many of them were not even developed. They had very old systems. Forget all legacy systems. Some actually were running uh, business of Excel sheets and access databases and old systems. And this is, this is happening right now. It's uh, difficult to understand. And so we had to try to get all these different formats also uh, connected. But while we do that in terms of the immediate, the longer term is to work with each institution to actually develop a full system. So right now we're, we're, we're trying to do shared government systems, or I think that the world is now going towards uh, you know, digital public infrastructure, or digital public goods. We're saying rather than you having your siloed little small system, let's build one large shared system that you can reuse. You can use and use many times. And so we're now using a shared approach to provide services, if it's financial management, if it's payment systems, we're saying let's have one shared cloud-based system. So I think it's a mindset issue, but secondly, it's also helping every government institution to build a proper system that can share uh, data. Many of them were never built to share data. Thanks, and uh, I guess uh, Mas is coming, into, uh, coming to you with governments going through this digitization journey around the world. There's a tendency to move towards open source. Works well for us mm. uh, because we are open source. But um, with, I think France has uh, severed ties with a uh, fairly big software house and preferred to go open source as well. Do you see other governments following that approach or how is Latvia looking at it? Uh, yeah, uh, not only they uh, look, but they already uh, have started uh, this, yeah, this approach. Um, yeah, mainly because uh, vendor lock is uh, yeah, a real problem, but uh, mm. uh, <laughs> but also so uh, like our uh, developers, uh, our teams in Latvia can uh, look at the code and uh, implement more and better things than uh, than uh, like a closed source uh, software, um, and yeah. Uh, that's why, like, uh, these, uh, these uh, past few years, uh, when I worked uh, at uh, the central government, um, we have uh, uh, switched a lot of systems, like, uh, yeah, for example, WSO2, uh, yeah, API manager, um, because beforehand, um, all of the services, uh, like, uh, were uh, uh, at, at one place, uh, be, uh, first of all, uh, high availability was uh, yeah, the, the main problem, but uh, also uh, none of the uh, people uh, who had uh, set up uh, the, the old systems, the legacy systems, uh, wanted to touch uh, those uh, systems that were in place. So uh, that uh, meant that's a problem for us, uh, uh, for updating and uh, yeah and uh, keeping the security that you need for governments um so yeah but uh, moving like uh, towards uh, open source uh, we can uh, uh, buy and uh, uh, get more people that uh, can yeah can uh, see uh, the 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 code and uh, understand it uh, so, so yeah, so we can implement new features, new security things, and so on uh, for for the uh, systems. And uh, I think uh, they won't die as quick. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, so, so, Colin, going back to uh, the Uganda story. Yeah. Um, with digital identity, how have uh, citizens embraced it? Okay. Uh, have they... Uh, so how has that sign-up process been, um, and how do you see that evolving? Yeah. So, um, 
as I did hint in my presentation, digital ID has got to be our next big step uh, in Uganda. So, and that should have been one of the first things that we do uh, in hindsight, to make sure you have digital ID for single sign-on for the different services, uh, and also be able to standardize the identification. Right now, as I said, it's quite decentralized. Um, it's happening at different system levels and application levels. I know uh, some people that are signing on using mobile phone numbers, others are using uh, you know, their public accounts like Gmail. So it's still very, very unstandard. And, and, and we also have a certificate-based digital authentication system that you know, is yet to fully mature. So let's say that this is part of our next steps, really, in Uganda, the importance. We have a, a national ID, but it's still, it's still very legacy built. It's not digital. You still have to present a physical ID sometimes or place in your national ID, uh, ID number into the system for you to have a verification. You've got to present this card everywhere you go. So I think it's important now that we're going fully end-to-end -end digital to actually begin to roll out, uh, roll out the digital ID. And so one of the things, the major discussion points for me, because I'm always learning, I'm looking to learn in this conference, has been just the posturing and usage of our identity server. The fact that we already have uh, this, this module up and running, we've not used it much, I think is a great opportunity now to actually focus and try to see how to maximize the identity or IM uh, you know, opportunities within WSO2. So let's put it this way, we don't have a digital ID yet in Uganda. It's the next step, I think it's the next big step now to really unify and standardize our, our, our identity. Thanks, and uh, next questions, I guess, to all of you. Um, so in Colin's uh, session a little while earlier, he was saying that by sharing information, SSO and KYC, uh, they were able to bring down um, the time it takes to open a bank account from four days to, I think it was 30 Three seconds? seconds? Three to five seconds. Three to five seconds. Mm -hmm. So have you seen other governments uh, exposing these services to the private sector? And have they been monetized as well? Mm -hmm. um, in Italy, we have a um, digital identity. The name is Speed. Uh, is um, powered by public and private uh, that uh, implement uh, identity provider. Uh, is useful only for um, web application, so it's not so needed to, to improve this, uh, this system. Uh, today, uh, 38 million people have this digital identity, uh, keeping account that uh, we are uh, uh, 58 million, so it's a good number. Um, but I need to improve this uh, identity because uh, uh, it's used only uh, by citizen. We have also for, um, for business, but it's not so used because it's not so standard. Uh, but uh, something's changed uh, at the European level because this uh, local digital identity only for uh, uh, Italian people. Um, European is um, uh, trying to address uh, European digital identity that is uh, useful for uh, all the country. And um, we will put on this digital identity also other uh, useful attributes also for business, but not now. Uh, for example, uh, we can put on this digital identity the drive license, uh, health ID, and so on. So this is the way uh, uh, we are working on this. And um, Italy is a, is a pilot on this. Manish, what about you? Yeah, so US is, as I said, there are already set um, APIs available for the federal agency, which talks to the different credit bureaus. Like I will give an example which we use. It's called remote identity proofing. Uh, pretty much it, you use the same kind of service when you apply for a mortgage or a you know, a car insurance, um, buying out a car or anything like that. So when somebody comes into our, you know, system and they say, hey, I am, um, 
Pablo, sorry, Pablo, uh, and then say, hey, give me your you know, identification, right? So we kind of call that API and essentially collect all the demographic information, make sure that uh, it matches to all the records, and then the API returns back a whole slew of questions. It does not affect your credit score. Um, a lot of people get worried about that, but it's more like a, a soft pull, if you will, and so it does kind of do that verification. That's why I was talking to him to say, if you have something like that in Uganda. Uh, so it's a very matured system. That API is available for usage. It uses, uh, uses if people who are technical, uses REST JSON service with OAuth 2, uh, pretty secure with TLS 1.2, and with all the certificate exchange and all that fun stuff. Um, so yeah, I would say that uh, from that perspective, the know your customer from a private sector or from a public sector, it's kind of a good amalgamation using the same API. It doesn't matter who the front end calling is. If it's applying to JP Morgan Chase, it'll be a hard pull. But if you are going to like our site, public site, uh, public government sites, uh, you would say that, hey, I'm a citizen and I'm Pablo and I want to apply for Medicaid. And you come to our portal, we will kind of know you already based on your information you provide. And if you pass those questions, then you're allowed to apply for uh, the Medicaid through the uh, digital footprint of submitting that application form. So that is one way to kind of identify. And there are other ways. There are people who just walk into the field office and say, hey, I'm so-and-so. And you take up all those form of um, IDs, government-issued IDs. Um, uh, we kind of do a kind of quick verification, we and we, with our federal agencies. We have like a lot of buttons to push. Um, but it essentially tells that that person is uh, who, he, who he or she is. And then uh, we kind of take it, that application's kind of intake form, and then we walk him or her to the rest of the process. So there are you know, ways and means, either it's an in-person documentation or whether it's remote, then you go through a digital footprint of knowing the customer. Thanks, and I think, um, Colin, another question for you. Yeah. Uh, Manish earlier was talking about how um, when it comes to digitization, um, you know, there are slightly, sl slight nuances in how it's implemented, but the base requirements are more or less the same, right? But if you look at uh, Estonia and South Korea, they seem to be leaders in terms of digitizing government services. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now they've started sharing their platforms with uh, other countries. So I think there's a transport system in Colombia that's um, developed the same as what's used in Korea, mm. and um, immigration platforms in Mongolia and so on. Do you see that reuse happening, or would each country want to sort of build their own, given it's a government service? Yeah, I think that's a good, it's a good point. I think it's a major talking point now in, in the forums that we sit in, uh, inter-government forums. Um, in the East African region, we've got an East African community we are now having forums for the African Union, and we have collaborations outside the country. I think, um, in my view, and this is my view, uh, countries should not be delving into reinventing the wheel mm. and trying to uh, do something that, that took eight years for Estonia and, uh, or other countries to do. If those countries now truly believe in open source and believe in the new concept of digital public infrastructure, that they can be able to pass on to another country. I think the best you can do right now, I think it was Sanjeeva who also mentioned, you know, the focus should really be around taking what's reusable and just innovate around the experience and not innovating around the engineering. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes there's so much focus around building again, mm -hmm. try to build your own thing, but you can actually just focus on building the experience. So I'm a firm believer, and right now our eyes are heavily, heavily around uh, what's happening also in India, India has done a very good job with Adaha and, and you know, the you know, UPI, uh, in, you know, ineffaceable payment interfaces. And India is willing, for instance, to give that intellectual property to Africa and to Uganda and say, build on this, you know, for free. All you have to do is customize it and make it work. I think strongly that that's happening. We have partnership with South Korea, with Estonia. We have partnerships now. Um, with, uh, with Dubai also. So basically, we, we, we believe strongly that we should not be focusing on building and engineering again. We want to focus now on taking what's working. Imagine what's working in India for, for the billions of uh, the people that are there, and we only have 45 million people. Mm -hmm. If it works for India, mm -hmm. surely it will be close to refitable for Uganda. So we are, we're happy to take some of that uh, 
uh, you know, digital private infrastructure and build our own customized experiences on it. So I'm a firm believer that rather than reinvent, take uh, what you can as digital diplomacy from other countries, receive it, build a fresh experience on it. That's my thinking. Thanks, you know, Masis. Do you think Latvia will have a similar approach to their digital journey? Um, like uh, for single sign-on and uh, such, uh, uh, for now uh, we don't have like uh, uh, the direction uh, to go like uh, uh, private sector wise uh, but uh, we uh, we do like uh, uh, specifically yeah uh, try uh, for all of the decentralized uh, government portals to use uh, our uh, platform our sign in platform our identity platform um, so so yeah the experience is uh, uh, seeming less uh, more or less uh, yeah uh, and uh, uh, everything like uh, in the main portal that you do uh, you see the changes like uh, address change or uh, something like that um, uh, everything is uh, like uh, seemingly uh, um, not migrated but uh, shown on the other side but uh, for uh, like uh, private uh, sector parts uh, for now we have the same um, problem as uh, Uganda's government that uh, they just uh, don't want to let go of uh, their data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Masis. And Marcus, so CSI is in the private sector. Yeah. And you service the public sector through contracts and tenders and so on, responses and so on. How do you how do you see that private public partnership being optimized or how do you think it should be optimized? Okay. Um, is a way to optimize uh, the relation between uh, private uh, and public. Uh, um, what, what we are doing to do this, uh, uh, go through again API. Because thanks to API, we can open our ecosystem also to third part. An example uh, could be uh, open data. We, we put in place uh, four years, no, five years ago, uh, a portal for open data. So uh, all, again, for all the area, all department uh, of uh, my region, it's for my, only for my region, not for other uh, um, local um, public institution, uh, we are regional portal with all the open data that we can, uh, cross area. So the, the private sector can access for free to this data and create uh, new services. Uh, this is a way, and uh, they are doing this. And uh, sometimes uh, they use, uh, for example, uh, for um, forecast, forecast uh, the, um, the movement uh, of uh, people uh, by, by car, by, by train, uh, also for uh, develop uh, uh, services for, uh, for the citizen. I think uh, Transport for New South Wales took that approach and they had 43,000 active users on the platform, developers. There were 9,500 applications built consuming those APIs. I think they have serviced something like 22 billion requests uh, in the last few years as well. Uh, thank you very much for, for your insights and uh, looking forward to talking to you offline about this as well. Thank you.